started. And as you see here. Okay, the topic this time around, matrix gaming. Uh, and we'll jump right into the presentation. Like I said, it'll be about an hour. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. Please just kind of jot, in, jot down any uh, questions you might have. Uh, and then we'll see if we can get to them uh, when we get to the Q&A portion. So I'll begin pushing the screen. And you should be seeing, uh, again, this is our crash course on the game design topics. Uh, and this is uh, Matrix Gaming. Uh, as Robert said, uh, I do a lot of design and education work for the Naval War College. Lots of things we can talk about uh, in future lectures. Things we kind of coordinate as people have an interest. And we do that through Robert as my, as my agent. That's what I like to say. <laughs> All right. So the uh, couple of disclaimers we have to give up front. Again, these are, are uh, the opinions expressed by myself. Don't necessarily reflect that of the college, the Navy, or the federal government. Um, we're going to go fast and furious, and you're not going to come away from this, just like the last one, where you're not going to come away as a master game designer. You're not going to come away as a master matrix designer. Um, but we hope basically this will give you the foundations that if you're interested in matrix gaming, you'll know where to pursue the resources and how to get better at it. Uh, this is going to, again, be fast and furious for about an hour. Again, your, your chat function has been disabled. You're all on mute so that we just don't have any interruptions from background noise. And we'll do some Q&A at the end. And as we said before, this session is being recorded. So matrix gaming, you, you almost can't say matrix gaming without someone having this visual right, of the matrix with Keanu Reeves and, and that, that series. So what exactly is matrix gaming. Why on earth is it called matrix gaming, right? Matrix gaming goes back several decades. Chris Engel is one of the early kind of uh, fathers of matrix gaming. And you can really think of the roots of matrix gaming as being uh, in dinner party murder mystery games, meaning that it was meant to be kind of, of ad hoc, free form, uh, very easy to role play and jump into it. I would give you a little bit of information in terms of um, for tonight's dinner, uh, after dinner party here, um, you're going to be the, the czar, um, you will be the heiress, and here's a little slip of paper with a little bit of, about your role. And at this point, it becomes what we call progressive storytelling, where each person contributes a little bit to the tale and moves the story along. And uh, eventually, we got a little more structure to them, um, some probability, because people would come up with some crazy things as part of the story, and people would say, ah! That's, that's implausible. So we came up with a little bit of a mechanism to check that plausibility, always with the intent of moving the story, story forward. So the matrix part of it was that if we were having a, say this, this uh, dinner party, and it was a murder mystery, right? Well, we would want you to make arguments that are relevant to a murder mystery. So we would want you to say things about murder weapons, motive, opportunity, and so we would often have a little vocabulary list of the sorts of things, both as a prompt for the participants and for you, because someone kind of has to host it and keep this, the story on the tracks, um, to say that, well, the more you talk from the vocabulary, the more you use these sorts of phrases, the more probable, the better your pieces will fit in the tale that we're progressively developing together. And if you go off of that script, but suddenly your argument becomes less compelling. So if suddenly you start talking about Wall Street and start talking about financial issues, people kind of look at you and go, well, you're kind of off the matrix. You're no longer in that vocabulary that is advancing our story. And the matrix would grow with the story so that if as part of the matrix or fact pattern that you're developing along this murder mystery, that someone made a plausible argument about one character's relationship with another character, and that was accepted into the story. Well, then another player could say, because of that relationship, it's already been established now in fact pattern, then something else becomes more plausible. So these stories were built around this growing matrix. Eventually, the matrix itself fell away, and that people were no longer using kind of this little list of words to describe the game. But the process of role play and progressive storytelling is at the heart of what a matrix game is. So the, the resources that you want to turn to if you're going to get interested in matrix gaming, right? By far, uh, the best is this one over here on the left. 
the original edition right here, Matrix Gaming for Modern Wargaming uh, by John Curry and Tim Price, uh, which is uh, part of a series of innovations in wargaming. And that was volume two. Now, uh, Tom Moat, uh, Major Tom Moat with the British Army is by far one of the very best, if not the best Matrix game designer and facilitator out there. And he's been doing Matrix games for both professional and entertainment purposes for 25 plus years. And he put together a little pamphlet. Uh, and actually, this was the document that uh, Richard, oh, I'm sorry, Richard, Robert distributed earlier. Um, and it was this practical advice on Matrix gaming. And it is, it is a, a chock full of nuggets on how to be successful at Matrix gaming. So the two put together uh, were then kind of put out in a second edition. So basically this and this kind of became the latest book that's out there, which is this Matrix Games Handbook. Uh, my recommendation, get the old book. Uh, I think the old book is a bit, it's tighter, it's slimmer. It's more on point, if you will, for people who want to be practitioners of Matrix Games. Um, and then get your hands on the PDF copy of this practical advice part. Um, this version, the handbook version, basically uh, added a lot of the, uh, the learning theory uh, and the psychology behind Matrix Gamings as part of its content, um, which may not be as useful to you as the actual practical implicate, you know, the practical advice for how to do it. All right. So what is a Matrix game? Right. These are games which are best suited for complex issues where you've got a lot of actors who have equity in the story, so to speak with varying interests and agendas. Uh, and they really fit nicely into kind of diplomatic uh, and conspiracy and convoluted stories that you're trying to gain a better understanding into. Uh, but realize what a Matrix game is trying to do. It is trying to create insights into problems, not uh, generate some qualitative, or I'm sorry, quantitative answer in terms of the likelihood of something occurring or not occurring. And one of the things that uh, it, it is a poor fit for is complex force on force modeling, the traditional war gaming. So if you've got a war game, which is essentially a problem that could be played out with, uh, you know, counters on a hex map, or you're looking at major combat operations in the South China Sea between the United States and the PRC, uh, and your interest is purely military from a force on force perspective, matrix gaming most likely is not the thing to use. If you're trying to understand the geopolitical posturing and maneuvering and issues of horizontal escalation around that conflict, Matrix Gaming could be spot on for what you want to do. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. What makes Matrix Gaming uh, attractive to some people is this idea that um, there's very little in the way of quote unquote rules. So people don't have to read a bunch of information and learn a complex set of rules to come and play a Matrix game. They can pretty much so walk into the room and after you give them a very short in brief, jump right into it. And I'll give you an example of a Matrix game at the, at the end here. Um, and there's not a list of what you can and can't do per se. Uh, so it's very free form. Uh, and that way it's very accommodating to complex moves that you might not have been able to think of in advance to be able to have these structured rigid rules that you might find in a more of a structured board game type of environment or, or tabletop war game type of thing. Um, and there's not a whole lot of specialized equipment type of thing that goes with it. So that's what makes people say, ooh, this matrix gaming sounds easy and, and low cost and low cost, yes. Easy? Maybe, maybe not. So let's look a little bit more about kind of, of how you can wrap your head around of the kind of environment that Matrix Games creates. Um, Matrix Games, for all of you, you Dungeons and Dragons fans out there, and, and I grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, Matrix Gaming and a, and a session of Dungeons and Dragons looks very similar in terms of you've got somebody, a Matrix Game facilitator, a dungeon master, who is providing the guidance and the initial, initial narrative to the story that the players are now going to contribute to by their actions to move it forward. So not dissimilar to, again, once I set up the dungeon, I turn it over to the player and say, what do you do? And it's a series of actions, which the players then undertake, some of which are adjudicated using rule sets and in, in Dungeons and Dragons, the D20 system of dice rolling with modifiers, et cetera, right? Um, but that's the kind of the, the, the similarity there. It's very similar. Uh, and people who have played Dungeons and Dragons usually find Matrix Gaming a very easy transition to, right? Um, 
I mentioned earlier the kind of the how to host a murder mystery games that were popular once where you could buy a box and in the box it would have uh, for all of your dinner guests, you know, a name tag with an identity they, they would assume and a little booklet with their backstory and maybe some clues that they were to give out at certain times over the course of the dinner um, as we begin to investigate uh, the murder. And, and if, you've, if the sharp-eyed uh, will recognize that right, right there, that's me, Serica, 1986, <laughs> playing one of these games with uh, some uh, college friends uh, shortly after we had graduated. Um, then, of course, you get people say, well, how is this any different than a tabletop exercise? You know, a bunch of people standing on a map and we're gonna talk through it. Yes, there are, again, structural similarities to a tabletop exercise. Uh, but we'll look at some of the differences that maybe separate it from a quote unquote, traditional military driven tabletop exercise environment from the matrix game environment. The other joke we make about what are the two differences is that Alcohol is available on Dungeons and Dragons and, and, and uh, Host of Mercy. I mean, not maybe so much the tabletops, but it, you know, tongue in cheek. But the point of that is that matrix gaming is a very social activity, meaning an important part of the game is the interplay of the people. So it's a very interpersonal story being told amongst the players. Um, I would contrast that often with tabletop exercise environments where the people are simply the engine that drives the action on the map. And it's about the little entities on the map interacting that is the focus and not necessarily the humans in the room interacting. So again, matrix gaming is very dependent on that interpersonal relationship and, and the interpersonal relation or actions between the folks that are gathered to play the game. The, the engine that drives most matrix gaming is this idea of the argument, where a player, in turn, will present, he'll make a statement that something happens. We call matrix games are biased to action, meaning that they are a series of statements that progress a story forward. So the, the basic format is a player says that something happens. Then they give the reasoning why what they want to have happen in the story is plausible. And a, a, not an uncommon format is what we call the three reasons format, where you have, you can give up to three reasons why what you say will happen is plausible. So that's our first part here. And we have this idea that something happens. I'll show you an example in a second. And then here's why it's going to happen. But the other players in the game have the opportunity to say, uh-uh, and to give you reasons why it might not happen. And they can give you counter arguments to your arguments. So in a little example here, let's say we we're doing this game, it's based on a Napoleonic Peninsular campaign uh, in the 19th century. And the player representing the, the Duke of Wellington, the Duke of Wellington says, I shall fortify the town. Now notice, in Matrix Gaming, you get to do one thing on your turn. You can't say, I will fortify the town and advance on the neighboring city and bring forces across the channel and, and, and. You get to do one big thing in your turn. So in this case, Wellington has decided that he's going to create a defensive position in the particular town that he currently occupies. He shall fortify that town. And he claims he can do it because he's got manpower to do it. He's got the money to pay for the work. And the weather is well is fine, and it looks like they should be able to build this in the time that he is proposing. Now, the Napoleonic player says, uh-uh, I don't think so. I don't think you can do it as quickly as you think because now he provides the countervening arguments in terms of the troops you're using are, are not as well trained as the British regulars. And yes, the weather is fine. As a matter of fact, it's almost too fine. It's too hot. And there's little access to fresh water. Your troops are going to dehydrate, and they're going to work slower. Now, Notice the nuance here in the argument. Napoleon is not arguing that Wellington cannot fortify the town. He is arguing that he cannot fortify the town quickly. And that's an important distinction. Matrix gaming doesn't work well when one side says up and the other side says down. It just says, no, I wanna do something. And the other side just keeps saying, you can't do that because something has to happen. So while Wellington may or may not be successful, something is going to happen 
not players aren't just going to freeze uh, the little you know the little troops in this case in this in a Napoleonic conflict they're not going to freeze and do nothing for that turn something will happen it may not be exactly what Wellington wants or it could be exactly what Wellington wants but he is going to make an argument and if you get the the books especially that first book I mentioned it'll go through what are considered strong arguments and weak arguments in matrix play but we'll just assume right now that, that all the arguments are what we call valid arguments, um, and that's what's been made so far. So now, what we would say is, okay, as the moderator, as the facilitator of this matrix game, I have heard three reasons why this will work, but there were two reasons why not. And all of them sound, uh, I will not dismiss any of them out of hand. Like for example, had the Napoleonic player said, um, it is unlikely that Wellington can do this because aliens are going to uh, teleport away all his troops and eat them. All right, that would be waged as a weak argument, all right, and probably discounted by the moderator. So in this case, though, both sides have made valid arguments, three to the four, two to the against. The net is one positive. Now, in matrix gaming, a style then of determining what happens is to use two die that you then cast and seven is the magic number that propels the game forward. So as long as the player who is proposing an action gets a seven or better as modified by the arguments, then the game that his action will occur and it'll, the game will proceed. So in the first example, he rolls a six, we get to add one, seven, Wellington gets his way. If he were to cast the die and got a three and a one, um, even with the plus one, he gets a five, he doesn't get his way, but that doesn't mean that he does nothing and the town is not fortified. This is a case where now the facilitator may look and say, ah, oh, you, you know, you missed it five, you needed a seven, you got a five. Um, and it would say simply that in this case, Wellington is able, is not able to fortify the entire town and is only able to erect breastworks on the northern approaches to the city and not the surrounding roads to the east, west, and south. That would be a very plausible kind of, of, of flow to a matrix argument. For the people who like then suddenly go, oh my God, now we're just throwing dice, it's all random. It's like, no, stop it. Die are simply random number generators, but in the case of throwing two die and looking for seven, you basically have a standard deviation and normal distribution of outcomes. So sometimes it's handy for the people in the room who desperately want all of this to fit into an Excel spreadsheet, that here are the probabilities that would go with those sorts of adjustments in terms of if you say someone's got a plus one or a minus one chance of success, well, there are the actual probabilities that you could map these to. Now, one of the things that sometimes people do is they get, they get uncomfortable a bit with some of the numbers, like 83.3, and would rather use what we call a semantic scale. And that's what you see at the bottom there in terms of the highly likely, likely, maybe, unlikely or highly unlikely. It's called the semantic scale, and it typically uses a 90, 70, 50, 30, 10 framework. So you could have this argument and, pe and get people, people won't come down and, and come up with a number, right? They just, it's difficult sometimes to get a group to say, yes, I think it's 70%. But they, they will say, no, I think it's likely. Okay, well, likely means 70%, now we'll throw the die, okay? So that is a methodology in terms of dealing with the probabilities that an event as articulated would move forward. Now, sometimes you'll have a very technical issue that you're kind of matrix, you're trying to matrix game around, and it would be helpful if you had a, a group of experts in that field who can help with this adjudication process. At the college, we tend to call these people the, uh, um, the Greek chorus. So they sit back and they listen to the arguments and then the moderator turns to them and basically they then decide uh, by a voting scheme whether or not the argument for the, the actor, we'll say in this case is blue, is successful versus the antagonist, in this case red, is not. Um, just to make the numbers easy, I picked a 10 man kind of representation, although man, this, the man on the end here, the blue man and the red man aren't really there. Okay, they're stunt people. They simply represent that there is always at least one vote for the antagonist and one vote for the protagonist in this type of structure. The other eight are actually humans who can then debate and say, look, in this case, in the example to understand how the numbers kind of work, let's say every one of them thinks that the uh, red uh, antagonist made the best argument. Okay, so they all hold up their red card, in which case it's nine to one, right? So if you're using the straight voting method, then again, nine to one, why? Because there's always one vote for the, for the one side. Um, then you could say, then clearly it is the antagonist version of events that will transpire. On the bottom 
example? Nope, what if they all go the other way and all raise their blue cards? And then it's the protagonist that gets his way. Now, you can have the whole split thing, you can do it this way, where after discussion, two of the experts think that blue made the more compelling argument, and uh, six of them thought that the red side made the more compelling argument. So that's two to six, but then you add the standing blue vote and the standing red vote, and now you have a situation where you can either simply say majority rules, it goes to red, or you can convert this into probabilities. So that means that there's a 30% chance that Blue's events transpire favorable to him, and a 70% chance that it goes in, uh, against him, so to speak, more in favor of the red version. Either one of these methods is fine. Uh, and again, in games that have a high degree of maybe technical understanding, um, you might need that panel to help you out. Uh, imagine you were playing a space game where uh, the players were talking more about space um, policy, but some of it did relate to actual orbitology and understanding the space environment, in which case then you'd want to maybe have some people who are more experts in space being able to weigh in and help with the decisioning. Okay? So that's kind of part of the voting schemes, but who, what roles are we playing? Who should people be in a matrix game? So the, the general rule of thumb is that for the situation you have at hand, you can typically identify the two key protagonists and antagonists, all right? And those are these folks here. So you've got your, your primary uh, combatants, if you will, that are on one side or the other of the issue, the matrix game, the scenario that the game is built around. Now, then you want to identify okay, people who are likely to be supportive of the blue side and supportive of the red side. Now, between them, they may have a little bit of, of friction. It doesn't mean that necessarily that both of these actors, uh, while they may both be supportive of blue, doesn't mean they're supportive of each other. It's indicated by this little lightning bolt here that shows there is some friction between those two. Um, and then you've got the externals, who could go for one, could go for the other, you're not really sure. So that kind of always sets up the base structure when you start thinking about putting together the matrix game primary protagonists or antagonists, protagonists and the antagonist, their supporting characters, and then some kind of neutral third party wildcard folks that play down the center. Now, everybody in a matrix game has an objective. Everybody has an objective. It's not just that there's an, an objective, blue needs to win the war, okay? That's the objective now, right? Everybody involved has their own objective. Some of the objectives may be aligned and supportive, some may be at cross purposes and antagonistic. We'll look at that here in a bit more. So here's an example that Tom Moat put together for an uh, Afghan game where he was looking at uh, post-conflict stability in Afghanistan. So his primary uh, combatants, so to speak, were the coalition, coalition security force commander and the Taliban commander. So this is your primary friction between these two guys, right? Now, on the blue side, the district governors were pro security force, and the Afghan National Army pro-security force. So they're aligned, can help in on this side. Uh, however, the tribal elders disliked the security force and were more likely to be aligned with the Taliban. The Afghan National Police were corrupt. So there was a pretty much so well understood that they didn't much care here for, um, for these guys. But at the same time, exactly were they actually helping on the Taliban side, don't know. So that was a bit of your, again, your third party wild card was the Afghan National Police. Now notice this note down here at the bottom about roles can be played by more than one person. And that's actually an important feature because you'd think you'd have a person being the Taliban commander, a person being the tribal level. By putting two people representing a single entity, even if the entity is, is a unitary person, like the president of the United States, you can have two people play the president. Now, they have to speak with one voice, but in the process of coming to that one voice, they have to do their own little intertalk. So one player may think that the United States president would do X. The other player is like, I'm not so sure that he would do X. I think he'd probably do something more like him to Y. And, and given our objectives that, that, that the president has for this game, I think Y is probably, that's ah, probably a good point. So they tend to moderate each other and you tend to get a more, 
I don't want to say necessarily more plausible, but you tend to get a more mainstream response and you don't get some of these wacky outliers. Now, you may want wacky outliers for the purpose of the game that you're trying to understand, but by and large, having at least two people and not much more than three, I, I would not recommend more than three people play an entity, okay, um, can be a useful tool in getting some good actions articulated out of a player, especially for people who aren't maybe necessarily comfortable with the matrix environment. Um, pairing them up with some people who may be a little more experienced can help new people understand the sorts of arguments they ought to be making to progress the game. So these, when we say you're a player, you've got a role, right? You need to keep it as simple as possible, right? There's nothing worse than going and when someone walks into a Matrix game and you hand them a 20 page booklet that they're supposed to absorb before they can start to play, right? So you want to keep the individuals. And remember I said, every individual in a Matrix game has an objective or two or three, right? And you want to keep those as succinct as possible. Because in my example here, like, you know, stay in power. Okay, that's a very straightforward uh, objective for a person in a political position, right? That is a far better objective than the longer ensure the continuity of the electoral process and the between politicians, la, 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 la. The, the problem with those is often they become overspecified. And it's very difficult for the player to then come up with any way, he, he can't interpret the objective uh, because it's so narrowly defined, it becomes rather difficult for him to think of, of ways to play towards it. So you want to keep them, again, relatively pithy. I'll show you some examples here uh, at, at the end. Um, but that's for his little, you know, you are the president. Here are your three objectives. You know, um, squash dissent, uh, ensure uh, uh, follow on, you know, follow on term and um, invade uh, Poland. All right, those are the three things you have to do. To put it into context, then you may need to give them something which looks akin to kind of like a, a Pamizi uh, brief, you know, political, economic, militarily, the, the way we kind of describe uh, situations. Um, and the list here is kind of a mishmash between both an American approach and a British approach, remember Tom being a Brit. Um, and what he recommends is this structure in terms of objectives long and short term. And the reason you want to do both long and short term in a matrix game is it's interesting how people will sacrifice long term success for near term gains. And that can be very, a very interesting discussion to have after the game about why people you know, did that, because almost all the time we are very short term in our, our horizons for accomplishing things and often will sacrifice the, the longer, greater good potentially for a short term win. Um, so you might want to think about having both long-term and short-term goals. goals. Um, and usually what that means is a short-term goal is potentially achievable within the span of the game. A long-term goal won't be accomplished in the span of the game, but you have to have laid the groundwork for it to be likely to be successful um, at a future date. And then again, a, a short thumbnail description about the political situation, the military, social, et cetera. But don't go and pad these briefings. These briefings are one page front and back, maybe. I'd prefer you keep it on one on the front page, right? And you only want to give players the information relevant to the game. So don't sit there and give the, the, the PRC player a bunch of information about the ethnic composition of China unless you have a specific objective for that player, which is to gain autonomy for the Uyghurs, right? Then now it's worth saying who the Uyghurs are. But unless you have a specific objective or a specific reason in mind, don't pad these with just, you know, flowery because you think it makes it richer. No, it doesn't. It just complicates it and it has more things I have to keep track of when I'm trying to play. So keep it succinct, keep it limited to the objectives, related to the objectives the players have been given. So how long do these games run, right? Well, typically you need to get people through about six turns all the way around the table. Okay, six times all the way around the table, given as many people as you got. Remember, and if you got like, you know, eight players and six, you know, six turns, you got 48, 48 goes at it. Um, for to really get enough back and forth going for action, reaction, counteraction to start to, to move the game into interesting, uh, into, you know, move it from where you started to, to some undetermined endpoint. All right, so the are, these are meant to be fast play. So this isn't a three day evolution, okay? Uh, typically these run a couple, of, like four hours. And it shouldn't take much more than 30 minutes a turn, right? So again, this is one of the roles as being a facilitator of a matrix game is to keep your eye on the clock and to not let players get bogged down into lengthy arguments that's slowing the turn cycle. Because while one person is, is making their pitch, 
there are five more people waiting to get things done and that helps them move towards their objective. So you're gonna to wanna to keep this pace going that if it goes much more than again, four hours or so, people, hey, this is a stand-up event. Okay, this is a stand-up on your feet, playing in real time, and much more than a half day, people get tired. Okay, they just physically get tired of play, right? So if you do have some combat, because ultimately people wanna use these in conflict situations, uh, and there's gonna be some combat, all right? And so I said, these are not great for, for complex force on force games, but it, you may have some, uh, you know, a militia force that's, that's involved and it runs into the regulars. So it could be some combat. And I'll show you an example of a combat one here at the end. But the method that's often used is called SCRUD, simple combat resolution using dice, all right? And I'm gonna walk you through a SCRUD round, all right? And, so, and if you get lost, get the book, <laughs> all right? Because again, it, it walks you through how to do SCRUD. And, and this is not the way, this is a way to deal with some combat situations. So in the example, basically, um, you use colored die, all right, to represent different forces. Not that a die represents a force, like this die is the 23rd Infantry Brigade. No, it could be, but, but by and large, simply you're using the colors to differentiate the strength of the units in play. Um, Chessex dice will sell you buckets of different colored dice. I've got a whole little rainbow collection of die that I use for this type of thing. So in this case, kind of the standard structure is it runs from this plus three, to minus two, meaning that whatever I roll, I'm gonna add three to, uh, all the way down to whatever I roll, I'm gonna subtract two, through, two from. And this is kind of the strength st structure, right? So the dark blue dice represent these elite troops, really good, they're really strong. Lighter blue, green, white, are kind of your regular standard run-of-the-mill infantry or whatever it is your, your die are representing. And finally, your, uh, your poorer units or more fragile units, um, yellow and red die. Um, so you start off with that little part. Remember I showed, well, I'll show you a board here where we actually had the colors marked so people can remember what the die do. So let's take a situation where in the course of Scrub, let's say that you've got uh, two commando teams, two elite commandos, and they are in a city and they are approaching a city block. And as part of this counterinsurgency matrix game you're playing, you've got some, some insurgents, but they're hardened insurgents. Um, so they're at least as good as quote unquote regular troops. Um, and there are two commando units and five of the uh, insurgent units. So that's two dice and five dice being uh, of the respective colors. So we throw the die, okay? So we throw our two dark blue die and our five white die. Now I said it's plus three on the blue. So the blue dies all get promoted to six and five respectively from their original three and two. We line the die up, matching high to low and excess die, in this case, excess dice on the part of these guys here, Okay, are all less than the, the least pair here, so they don't really, they don't add anything to the to play. So we really just look at the first two sets. So we see that six is gonna beat five, five is gonna beat four. So, so far our insurgents have taken two hits, okay? They've had two losses. They, they've had two failures in this, this back and forth that's going on between uh, the, on the city block uh, that they're fighting over. So maybe that represented the first hour of fighting. And there's gonna be another hour of fighting as the, as the battle rages on between these two units. So the first thing I'm gonna to need to do before I throw the die again though, is I need to demote those two white die that took hits, took losses. I need to demote them now from being white die to orange die because they've taken a loss. So that moves them one notch down my, my scale there from zero to minus one, which means they become yellow die. So we cast the die again. We apply their adjustments. So uh, we never can have better than six or worse than one. So the six stays a six, the four, the one becomes a four. Um, and again, we pair them up having adjusted them. And this time we see that the commandos have taken a hit or, or have suffered some sort of, of setback. So after these two rounds, the elite units have taken a negative one hit, so to speak. And the regulars have taken, the uh, insurgents have taken minus three. We do a third round, one final round. Again, as adjusted, let me throw the die. And you can see our insurgents are getting weaker, right? Because they're, they're die, more of their die are turning the, the bad colors, so to speak, of yellow and red. And my commando units are kind of hanging tough there. They're still the stronger blue colors. So we make our adjustments, we pair them up, and again, we have our results. So in this case now, the regular units have absorbed five losses and the elites one. Now at this point, I mean, you can keep doing this until you drive somebody in, into 
into zeros and that they're just gone, all right? Because once you get under minus two, the next step is to be have your die removed. But you've got flexibility. This is the power of scrud. Some rule sets say after three losses, you just take out one die. This is gone, all right? That unit has been permanently uh, no longer function, disbanded, dispersed, but it's no longer combat effective and it's gone. So you can take a die away. Um, there's the one and done rule that if you lose a head, a matchup, you're gone. It's it. So this is something that's often used with things like if you have, if you're trying to do a quickly resolve an air battle, aircraft don't absorb hits well. <laughs> you take a hit and you tend to you lose the airframe. So there's the one and done type of rules. Um, you can modify that if you get a six, it meant that you, you know, yes, six is almost always win, but that's a, a, a level of effort that now exhausts that, that die and it drops down a level to a five uh, to a lighter blue color until you have a resupply rule which says basically that that unit gets to rest for a turn and it gets to go back up again. You can make this as complex as you want, but the more you can make it complex, the more you're defeating the purpose of scribe, which is to keep it simple. I mean, you can even use your matrix arguments in terms of, I think my troops would have an advantage because they're in the high ground, uh, they have automatic weapons, and they have a clear field of fire. And you can say, those are some pretty good reasons. I'll give you a plus one on your die rolls, regardless of, of what their strength is, because they've got a positional advantage. All right. Uh, so that's how you can quickly resolve a portion of combat, which becomes part of the matrix game. If the game is just all about the combat, I'd suggest you do something different. Okay, then just using a matrix game exclusively to try to do that resolution. Now, so kind of what are the problems with the matrix game? Right, some people just won't get it. Right, they are incapable of role play. That's the problem. Okay, go back to my Dungeons and Dragons folks. Right, Dungeons and Dragons may have been other geeks of their time, but today they are the best negotiators on the planet. And they all turned into lawyers and bankers because they know how to negotiate, they know how to role play. They know how to project themselves into somebody else's shoes and see the problem from a different vantage point. That's the power of being a role player, is to be able to effectively inhabit someone else's skin and see the problem through their eyes. Now, some people cannot do it. My kids, despite the fact that I grew up playing D&D, &D, my kids don't get D&D. &D. When I tried to introduce the game to them, and I am dungeon master and I set up the dungeon type of thing and I and they're like an, an and a wizard and they come into the into the dungeon and I describe the setup and I say what do you do and they look at me and say well what can we do I go well what do you want to do what, what would you do if you were an elf that walked into this room well what am I allowed to do and they they, they totally missed this part because they were so used to games that said in your turn you may do one, two, three of the following. You know, and there's a menu. You can move, you can shoot, um, you can, if you're playing Pandemic, you know, you can move from one city to another city, but there's a finite menu of things you can do. Dungeons and Dragons, Matrix Gaming, doesn't have that finite menu, and some people just do not grasp it. And I tell you the worst case is when you've invited a senior officer to this game and they don't get it. I, that's a problem, right? There's no easy fix for that. Tom's got some advice. Um, the other problem with it is, is obviously it doesn't look complicated. It, it doesn't seem like there's there's enough sophistication and 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 complex models in this for it to be useful. And it just sounds like you're making it up as you go. Well, that's true, <laughs> you are. But these are just for those situations where we don't have clear understanding. We don't have good models. We don't have the type of data that would make this much more quantitative and approaches. That's why we matrix game, because it is all squishy, right? And that non-quantitative nature does frustrate people who are looking to somehow plot something coming out of the matrix game in terms of, of you know, force consumption rates. Well, I thought this game was going to tell me uh, how long the force could fight. No, matrix games won't tell you that, right? It may tell you all sorts of issues about how the commanders feel like they could or couldn't employ the force and some of the, the uh, employment strategy or employment challenges they encountered in doing it because of the way the adversary uh, countered. I played a Matrix game once, was all about just trying to navigate my way through a contested city, trying to get from one end of town to a munitions bunk on the opposite end of town. And the game, the, the clever mechanic that really was the game, we thought it was kind of a sidelight, but it was the whole point of the game, was that we were given some options some additional equipment to choose from to improve our chances for getting A to B. And the conversation we had amongst ourselves about the utility of that extra kit was really what the organizers were trying to get at. Uh, the 
the, the, the probably the, the one thing that I can't over emphasize is this idea that you need an experienced facilitator. Of course, the problem is how do you get experience at running them if you don't run them and they don't run them, you don't have the experience. This is like my mother telling me when I was 16, I don't want you driving in the snow until you have more experience. I go, well, how do I get experience driving in the snow if I don't do it? Well, when you have more, you can. It's like, we know what, <laughs> right? So unless you do it, you're not gonna gain the experience. So I wouldn't have your first foray into matrix gaming being before a group of four star admirals and generals. Now you wanna start lower. You might wanna go and participate in some matrix games, see it done by some people who are good at it um, before you try to wade into this yourself. Um, and obviously who you bring to the party, so to speak, is gonna profoundly influence how it plays. If you can imagine that you've got six people who don't get it standing around and after you've explained it and tried to give examples, they still don't get it. Your game is done, right? There, it's very difficult to salvage this because of who you brought to play. And these don't scale well. I mean, as I said before, one to three players representing an entity, and then uh, two, four, six, maybe eight entities total. So I'm talking about a, a party no bigger than 24, and that's a big, that's a big matrix game. Typically, you want to target your numbers down to more than the, the dozens of, you know, 12 kind of people type of thing. So a matrix game doesn't play well in a situation where you've got 50 people and you're trying to do this matrix environment you know, because of the nature of the rapid argument, counter argument, decision move on, and the flow that these things encourage. Large groups don't really game all that well. So one of the things that I always I plug on behalf of Tom Moat, because it says he is happy for me to distribute his practical tips book, but then at the same time, I need to push his products. <laughs> so um, I'll show you a game here in a second that, but you need some stuff, okay? So yes, they're low overhead, but usually a matrix game, it helps if you have some sort of, especially for a game that's involving any type of geography, a map and some way to represent some of the entities in play perhaps. Um, so the, uh, the matrix game construction kit, the M-A-G-C-K, um, is available for sale at GameCrafter.com. Just Google once you get there, search on uh, M-A-G-C-K. Uh, and it's a kit filled with, as you can see here, you get the core rules for matrix gaming that I've been describing. You get two matrix games included with it, Isis Crisis and the Reckoning of Vultures. Um, you get a whole grunge load of blank tokens and chips and, and bits uh, because you are, you're creating a game. You're a game designer and you're going to have to have some stuff potentially to show your people, so they kind of at least get a, a, a grounding of, oh, this is the battle space, or this is the environment, we're in a large city, we're in the Eastern Hemisphere, you're whatever, okay? Um, <clears throat> and other bits that help you run the game, like tracking maps, like what turn are we on, okay? And just a little track to be able to move a token along, remember you're on turn four, kind of thing. Um, and a whole bunch of dice, okay? Now, frankly, can you go and find all this stuff at, you know, between Staples and, and uh, Walmart and a game supply store? Sure, right? But these guys have put it together for you in a single stop. So I'm now going to quickly going to go through a matrix game that we play as part of the game course when we're trying to introduce matrix gaming. Um, this is the Falklands uh, Malvinas game that is in uh, that first book, uh, the introduction or the uh, war gaming matrix gaming for modern war gaming. Uh, and this is one of the games in there. So it's clearly going to be about the Falcons. All right. So this is the player briefing. This is the entirety of the player briefing. Okay, the date, so we ground them in time, it's April of 82, okay, Argentine forces have occupied the Falklands, the UN has passed a resolution, and three actions the British government has taken at this point. That's the totality of the briefing, okay. I did not get into the social economic construct of the people who live in the Falklands. I did not get into the history of the Falklands when the British first landed in the Falklands in the 1700s and claimed it for the king, because while that seems like it's a fun background and leads up to the crisis, it doesn't help the players. It gives them no information that they can usefully use given the objectives they were handed for this game. It's important here, I set the time length of each turn to represent 10 days because that bounds what you can do. So you can't, you know, if the action you're thinking takes 30 days, well then you better start that action on turn one if you expect to have it accomplished by turn three, all right? So this is when I said, what do you do this turn? Margaret Thatcher, it's what could she do in about a 10 day chunk of time, right? So what else do they have? Well, they gotta know who they are. So here are the players, right? In our Falklands game, we have two British players representing uh, the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Sandy Woodward, who was the commander of the task force sent to liberate the Falklands. 
On the Argentine side, we've got General Galli de Sieri, uh, who was the head of their, their, their military under down there. Um, the U.S. is involved, right? Now, you'll see that they've got no pieces on the board, so to speak, but they had an influence, okay? So we've got the U.S. President, Ronald Reagan, and his Secretary of State, uh, Alexander Haig, represented in the game. And then finally, other people who had a, quote, dog in the fight. Remember how we, stru how we structured this, right? The, the primary uh, antagonists, these folks, somebody likely to be supporting them, somebody who we're not sure, maybe, man, we don't know. And the UN's gonna have its own kind of objectives that he's trying to straddle both, you know, keeping all the parties somehow happy. Uh, so in, on the, um, for Chile, we had General Pinochet, and then uh, on the United Nations, the Secretary General uh, Perez de la Cuela, uh, in that role. So they're the players. Okay? So again, fair number, and usually these are played by two people um, when we go through this. Okay? So we have some force, because after all, this is a military occupation and a military um, freeing them right, from this situation. So what do we have? Um, very just basic outlines of the of the fort the force that the British had available, the submarine force and task force one, uh, and then reinforcements that weren't available to the third turn of the game representing task force two. Then on the Argentinian side, mechanized uh, infantry regiments and et, et cetera. But what I, something I want to point out here is look at the 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 lack of specificity in some cases. Look at all the Chil the Chileans. What do they have? A naval flotilla and a submarine force. What does that mean? It means what it means. That's it. We didn't need, for the purposes of play and what Chile was trying to accomplish in the game, I did not need to go and give them a breakdown of every frigate, every destroyer, every cruiser, and every submarine that Chile owned. It was irrelevant to play. This was a sufficient description of the force for the purposes of the game. Now, in other cases, we were very specific. You know, up here, we got HMS Hermes. All right, we have a specific ship name, okay? Um, but the uh, the commandos and the parasite, it's just you got two and three of them. Oh, but wait, down here, we actually have the one called out, you know, the second Scott. So again, you want to think about how you structure the pieces. And remember, all of them were, were remember my, my scrud system, they're all white dye. All of these forces are just basically white dye with the exception of the Argentinian forces were all considered to be minus one relative to the British forces, okay? So they all rolled yellow die, and on the Brit sides, we actually had the, the paras, all right? They were super cool, uh, all right? And they were a little bit better, so they had a plus one. All right, so that's the order of battle, okay? That's it. Now, we need something to lean over though, right? We're gonna gather around a map, okay? On the left side of your screen, this is the map we use. And look, it's not a map <laughs> in terms of, it does not accurately represent the geography of the North and South Atlantic. It doesn't have to. It simply has to show the relative position of stuff, okay? And so this works brilliantly. It's, a, it's almost like a, a mechanical schematic for the flow of forces. Now where distance matters, we had it annotated. Like on the board, we had a little note here. This, the, the distance between the UK and Ascension Island is 3,700 nautical miles. That's 11 days, or I'm sorry, 13 days. The cross that at, at a nominal 12 knots of advance, all right? North, uh, all of the United States is this dumb little box in the corner because they have no forces. They have political influence, but that's it. So I just made a box just to kind of show what the United States is and ditto on South America. All of South America is in a little box underneath North America, right? Argentina is a skinny little square because again, it's about just relative positioning and how easy it is for them to get to the Falklands. These are a little bigger, a little more expanded. Why? because we're actually gonna potentially have some ground combat that occurs here. So we need to add a little more, uh, give a little more territory for the tokens to live in, okay? So you don't have to have highly accurate maps. And I cobbled this together in PowerPoint and have my, my graphics suppose, print this on big paper, right? And you just stuck it on, on a piece of phone core. The actual pieces themselves, PowerPoint. I made this in PowerPoint, um, print them on stickers, sticker paper and stuck them to pieces of cardstock, okay? So these are my little tokens. So again, stuff you can make very easily, but this was to represent those forces I earlier described. What did we give the players? Well, this is what we gave the players, right? We had to give them, uh, an I we gave them a tag, an ID tag that they actually wore around their necks, all right? That way we knew who was who. So they had a little badge, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, et cetera. And I gave them an index size card 
that had their objectives. So Margaret, Tha the players representing Margaret Thatcher had three things. Ensure the Falklands stay British. Obtain U.S. assistance. What does that mean? And for them to figure out. Okay. And engineer something that could be, could be at least sold to the British public as a military victory by the fifth term. That's Thatcher's objectives. Okay. Were those the same objectives that Sandy Woodward had? No. Overlapping? Sure. But not exactly the same because they have different roles, right? He's a military commander, she's a political leader, right? Um, meanwhile, General uh, Galatieri had maintained the, inter the territorial integrity of the Argentine. So he wasn't gonna give them up. Keep yourself in power. Remember, this is, this is potentially a political game with UN and, and maneuvers and people could make arguments that um, due to collapse in public support, maybe after a military defeat by one side or the other, that there's a popular uprising and that there's a movement to displace the general as head of the uh, government. That could have been a plausible argument given events as they had unfolded. So he had an objective to make sure that didn't happen and to negotiate in a way that would potentially keep him in power. And this did influence the, the way they, he negotiated with the UN. And this last one is just really just kind of a, 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 a quote unquote fun one, just to keep him in character. Remember, the Argentines don't see these as the Falklands. These are the Malvinas. And we always kept reminding him anytime he started to say Falcons, we look at him, we go, I mean, the Malvinas, clearly, I mean the Malvinas Islands. What else did we use? All right, they had about a, uh, the night before they play, they got about uh, two pages, two, three pages um, that had everything I've talked about in terms of, you know, the order of battle, a uh, quick little player briefing that just reiterated what was on that first slide. And that's about it, a couple, couple three pages for them. And then what I used on the left side of the screen as the umpire, was my, my turn record sheet. Because as umpire, it's up to me to decide who gets to go first every turn. It's not always just around the table, you go, you go, you go, you go. Depends on what's going on in the action. And I may want to change who gets to go first. So what I would do is, as I would go through, like in this case, let's go, this was like for turn one. I gave Thatcher and Woodward the first moves. Then uh, Argentina went next, then the UN, then I let the U.S. go, and then finally Chile. Now, that may be a very different order in the next round. It all depends on the actions taken. And I would then write shorthand, you know, real quick. Okay, what did, what did Thatcher say? What, what resulted? Okay, and, and what happened, and what happened, and what happened? That way, at the end of a round, it's usually very helpful for the umpire to say, okay, so to recap, after 10 days, remember I said each move was 10 days, after 10 days, the British have continued to push their military force towards the Falklands. It's currently en route to the Ascension Islands. The UN has demanded a cessation, blah, 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 blah. Right? And I just give a quick summary and I go on to move two. All right. So that's some of the stuff that you need to do it. So what do these look like in play? Well, here we are. We're playing. Okay. So here we are at the, one of the wargaming courses. Uh, people have got their badges on for different roles. And I'm giving a quick, you know, just orientation to the board in front of them. Um, look, right back here is our, your, your sponsor, Robert, hiding back there in the background, All right? And uh, again, players are beginning to talk about, well, we would do this, we would do that. And I'm asking clarifying questions. I'm saying, so let me understand if I, what you're saying is the British are doing this. Is that what you mean? Kind of thing. And somebody else would chime in and go, well, hang on. I don't think the Brits would be able to do that. It, didn't you say they were this or that? And, and again, it's a dialogue for and against the actions that we're taking, right? And again, you can see like on the edge of my boards there, you can see little areas like over here, you know, I had a little tracker that I used about those whole arguments for and arguments against to keep track of or were they currently positive to the, uh, the antagonist or positive to the protagonist. Um, there was a turn tracker. You can just see on the edge of the screen here, where I kept track of what turn it was. And then right here in the middle, there was actually a little dice area where we just kept, kept the dice and people could remember, oh yeah, dark blue is, is better than, than red, okay? So again, it's discussion-based with a moderator moving it along based on these arguments. Here's uh, the, our, or whatever, our, our players representing the UN. And they were arguing for things like the UN is gonna host a conference and invite the Americans and whatever to the thing. And, and I would say, fine, does anyone oppose to this? No, no, great, go over to the corner and talk for three minutes. And then come back in and tell me what your actions are, right? And people would come up with moves, they would say they would do something and then they would lie and not do it later, all within the realm of a matrix game, okay? So this is kind of, again, a little bit better view of some of the little stuff on my side of the board here, just where I'm keeping track of, of action as it plays out and my notes in front of me. So the, you can see, this is a stand up and talk. 
Think on your feet, react to the arguments around you, progress a story, okay? That's matrix gaming, right, in a nutshell. All right, the last thing I wanted to do is, is, is mention here as we're done the top of the hour is this, okay, well, but how do you, I mean, what's, what's the, okay, the game is over, then what, okay? So let me just show you, I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna switch over to a whiteboard presentation here real quick. Um, and let me stop this, and we're gonna go back to this, and let's go here. So the, uh, the Dato Institute uh, in Israel uh, uses a format of this um, with very senior leadership. And what they do is they take this approach. They say, we know our past. Based on the past, we can project a possible future. Impossible future, possible future. And it's that possible future they matrix through. Okay, they, they matrix game their way through a, a potential issue threatening Israeli security in a future. Then at the end of that game, they say, okay, um, and they do a debrief in character, but then they come out of character and they assume their day job roles because these are actually played by significant uh, leadership to include the you know, prime minister and president of, of uh, prime minister rather, of Israel. And then we say today, the present, if we don't like this possible future, what do we have to be doing today to preclude this future in the future? But it's only one future. So that's understanding one security risk. But remember, yeah, I can probably make another case for another future and another case for another future. So these are you know, future scenario work, possible uh, uh, when you do scenario planning kind of thing. And all of them then start to come back to today. And all of these understanding the spectrum of threats that could face the Israeli state and understanding the range of options to counter, because they don't know which one of these might occur, but if they can start influencing the things that lead up to that, maybe they can preclude a particular disadvantageous future from occurring. I mean, so that's how the Dato Institute uses this kind of approach. So with that, we are at the top of the hour. We hit our hour mark. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over into, um, Robert, and we can entertain some questions. Yes, so I would say if you've got some questions, just uh, chime in. Make, make yourself known. <laughs> yeah. so Pete, hi, this, this is Amy. I was on the last call and uh, yep. Just first of all, just want to say thank you. You're you're such a fantastic teacher. I really appreciate what you're doing here. I was particularly interested in the thing that you just talked about about 30 seconds ago. And it's not that I even have a specific question. I just want you to say more. And, and let me kind of tell you where I'm coming from. You know, coming from a State Department perspective, we're probably not going to be dealing with troop movements the way that many of your examples are dealing with troop movements. But sure. in terms of looking at a possible future scenario, can you give us an example perhaps, or I'm just trying to think if there's more that you can share about how we can design, maybe here's the question I'm trying to get at, how can we design a game, again, not necessarily really that concerned about the troop movements because we're more focusing on what right. diplomatic moves and the like that we can take with that last scenario. I, I would appreciate more thoughts on that. Yeah. So one of the things, and actually I was just having this discussion with a, uh, another colleague about this sort of, of scenario planning approach is one way to, to approach these, uh, that kind of situation where you want people to work through like policy decisions. Okay. Um, and this is something that uh, like Tom Moat was asked to, to on a Friday, be prepared to run a matrix game on a Monday for uh, senior parliamentarians, British government who were debating uh, not a, you know a, a force on force problem. They were debating um, some force acquisition problems and just policy issues uh, and about uh, making changes internal to organizational structures. And he had to sit there and think about okay, so unless everybody would simply just say yes to whatever it is the British government's going to do, then there's going to be friction, both internal 
to the organization, because again, we say monolithic things like, like your own Department of State. Well, you've got a zillion offices and departments and you know, sub compartments within state. Okay. Same thing with the DOD. People often say about, well, how does DOD do war gaming? I go, which part? Okay. So there's going to be internal frictions that you may want to be curious to understand better. And so you start thinking about, well, okay, who are the likely people who are going to be antagonistic towards this policy decision internal to one side of the problem? Um, and who are going to be likely going to be pushing it forward and wanting to say yes and more kind of thing. So policy games, uh, there was one policy game again, that it was looking at a, a uh, for the uh, the Royal Air Force about a, a force buy uh, in terms of uh, the F-35 and uh, going forward with the United States and the Strike Fighter. That wasn't about, you know, force on force. It was about policy v. policy and the way the Royal Navy or the fleet air arm saw their role in the world and whether or not they should be the force that was going to receive or the part of the service that was going to receive that or should it be some other part. But those are kind of dealing with current problems. But what they're trying to work through is the what if downstreams, okay? So if we pursue a policy, uh, what should we expect in terms, what could we expect, not should expect, what could we expect in terms of antagonism or uh, opportunity to advance that policy goal? That's kind of taking a forward, a now forward approach. But you can also do it the other way around, where you can set up a future scenario where you say, if we assume, and this was a game we did in 2008 at the War College looking at future force structures, where we said, if we pick two factors that could shape a future world, and let's say the two factors are resource rivalry, so competition over water and food, water primarily, and increasing militancy, which we were looking at as basically non-state actors gaining um, increasingly, increasingly sophisticated military capability. Now those two are disconnected, which is what you want. You don't want to do two factors that like rise and fall together automatically. Okay, so you don't want you do it. We used to talk about you know, how inflation and unemployment were tied together. All right, um, this doesn't always seem to hold true, but those are have some some fairly. I don't. I hate to say well understood if you're an economist uh, relationships, but but you want to look for things that you don't think that one automatically drives the other down or up in relationship because that what that gives you is four futures. Right? So I can take one, on one axis, I can plot the, the resource rivalry part where water is plentiful, water is scarce, and then cross it with a world where the militants are heavily armed and the militants are not. So I end up with this, this catastrophic corner where everyone's fighting over water and they've got heavy weapons to do it. And I have the opposite corner where water is plentiful and quite frankly, it, there's not much of a threat outside of nation states in terms of armed conflict. That's not a very interesting box, by the way. The other three boxes are interesting. So based on that, we then we said to the players, so tell me, players, if you're in this world, what are your driving concerns? What are your policy issues you're worried about? Tell me what that world looks like based on your expertise. And now tell me where the United States cares, because we don't care about every fire, right? We don't run around putting every fire out in the world. There's some, some terrible things going on that we tend to ignore because it's not in our national interest to get involved. So where are the ones we're going to get involved in? Where does the military play? Where does diplomacy play? Where does economics play? What are the levers they could possibly pull? And we just kept peeling this onion back and back and getting people to talk about the actions that would, which could um, manifest out of their, their area of expertise. Ultimately, we were interested in capabilities on the military end because it was a Naval War College project. But along the way, we were unearthing all sorts of things about the disconnect between diplomacy uh, and then the military side. Um, we were running into issues of economic interest, people who were looking at this problem saying, yeah, but if this plays out in Africa, I get a very different answer than if it plays out in Asia. It's like, tell me more. Because I, I didn't say which part of the world it was in, you know, kind of thing. So we do these kind of scenario work where either we propose a condition now and we say, okay, what's it going to get that done to accomplish that goal? Because that's somebody's goal in the game is to get that particular policy through. But in your pregame research, you've thought about all the potential antagonistic forces that are gonna drag back on it. Congress, an ally, an adversary, Wall Street. It depends on what the policy is you're trying to push. And you may not need a map at all, okay? Usually we use maps because a lot of what I do obviously has a military context to it. But you may not need a map at all. Um, we had one game that, um, who put it on? It was uh, King's College London. They're, um, they're, 
their defense studies thing. But it was, it was very much more of a UN kind of thing, and it was about stability operations, and really, they just had a map of the earth, you know, the, the world. It just so people, if you forgot where Cameroon was, you could real quick check in on the map. But there was no pieces on the map. We weren't pushing stuff around. The map was just something to put in the middle of the room as part of the dressing um, reference point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's two potential approaches, is take a policy, push it forward, take a future, and peel it back. Thank you. Yep. What else? Again, matrix gaming, everyone's talking about it because again, they think it looks, oh, it, it looks to be low overhead, small, easy, not a whole lot of design effort. Yeah, well, not, I mean, some of that's true. Um, but it, it does take someone who, who is familiar with the material and at least process wise. And you, and you don't need to be, I, I mean, I run matrix games where the topic at hand, yeah, I got some knowledge of it because I had to put the game together. Do I have the detailed knowledge that the participants have? Well, no, but that's not my job. I'm not there to interpose my thoughts. I'm there to pull out their thoughts and to figure out where there's some frictions between the different people in the room and to, and to keep the thing moving forward and not to be the guy to say, well, I think you're wrong. Um, in my opinion, as a facilitator, you never say, in my opinion, because you're just a mechanical device yourself to provide for other people to express what they think is relevant. Hi, Pete. This is Lauren. Hey. Thank you so much for all the information you just gave us. Really, really insightful and helpful. Um, you know, we're we're trying to start from scratch here and and help teams that can come to us as facilitators. So we first want to sort of create a test one that our team can practice on. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, where do we start? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we center everything around one question and then build out parties or do we start with a conflict with two sides and then build out the players? What, where do you think I should start? Yeah, so um, first thing you wanna do is grab that first book, okay? <laughs> um, the, uh, the Matrix Gaming for Modern Wargaming or Matrix Games for Modern Wargaming Volume Two. Uh, I think it's innovations. If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, and again, I recommend the, the earlier edition over the older edition. But what you'll find in there, okay, there's only about, I mean, the whole book is, I don't know, is, is, it, is it 20 pages? Maybe. Um, but the first couple of pages are the mechanics. The rest of it are practice scenarios already canned for you. You know, in terms of it's the Balkans. Um, it's a, I think there's one of them that has a cyber uh, aspect to it. I mean, so they're already kind of packaged um, and that might help you as you look at those go, okay, let's just try one of these. I mean, that Falklands game is right out of that book. Okay, the player lay down, the, the, the people, the uh, objectives they should have, all that stuff is straight out of the book. Okay, um, and so that might help you at least get an idea of how to you know, kind of meander down this way. What I would not recommend you do is for your first time out of the gate, trying to think about how you put together these games is to pick some really complex interagency problem, okay? You kind of want to start with something that has a clear good guy, bad guy. And, and as an example, Tom Moat will tell you the stories on, on a, 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 a dinner at his house will turn into a matrix game. And there are things like, you're gonna rob a bank. Okay, so you guys are the bank robbers. Um, you're the sheriff, you're the townsfolk. You're the banker. Here's a little crude map of, of Deadwood. And here's the bank, you know, and here's the vault. And you're at this end of town and everybody else is over here. Go, okay? He keeps it really simple, okay? You have a clear sense of good guy, bad guy, or, you know, blue side, red side, and potentially who would be aligned with who to start. But again, you don't want to get complex really fast. And that's why I recommend people when they wade into, into, uh, into matrix gaming, you pull one of the, you, the games out of that book and you try to run it, you run it for your closest colleagues in the building, you know, kind of thing. And it doesn't matter that nobody there has any knowledge of British military employment in the Falklands, for example. It's not the point. It's to learn more of the process and to get comfortable. Um, and there's a lot of good advice in uh, Tom's booklet there about how to think about setting these up, how to think about the pitfalls, the challenges you're going to run into, and the sorts of questions when players go off the track, uh, et cetera. So I would start simple and small with a clear kind of pro con problem, um, pull it out of the book. If you, that's a good place, a great place to start um, and just get comfortable kind of with this storytelling format. Um, and then 
you can start thinking about, okay, it's all about conflict and understanding um, who aligns with what party. And then you can start thinking about things that are a little bit more complex. Um, but you'll never design, you're not supposed to be able to design the perfect, quote unquote, perfect matrix game in terms of understanding all the relationships and objectives between the parties. That's typically what you're using the matrix game for. You're trying to understand how, if these players have these motives, they might play out in the context of this interrelationship between these people around the, around the board. Um, we're not to say that you necessarily got the objective exactly right, but if that's an objective, how did the Secretary General play his part? Why did he play it that way? Why did he see that as an important part of his move to do that thing he did on move three? The rest of you, do you think now, now that we're in plenary, you know, and we're just discussing, do you agree that's a plausible problem for the UN to face? Or do you think that was unrealistic uh, concern for the UN? Well, if it is a concern for the UN, what does that mean for us? It, you know, that's how you then kind of uh, the um, your competency in doing this sort of thing. But start small, start out of the book. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Pete. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that I really appreciated your uh, Dungeons and Dragons reference as someone that <laughs> is a DM for a weekly dungeon uh, for a weekly D and D campaign. Outstanding. Um, and um, I had a couple. I have two questions for you from a from a facilitator's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, number one. Do you have any tips with regards to how to handle people, players that struggle with the role playing aspect? Yeah. Um, something that you pointed out earlier in your presentation. And number two, have you found in your course of, for example, um, repeatedly running a particular scenario, do people, do the outcomes play out fairly predictably or do people kind of get really creative and do you see a high variance in kind of some of the outcomes for like a particular game, for example? Yeah, so I'll do the, the later one, the last one first, because it's the easier question to answer. <laughs> um, so what you see is, uh, is, is the, we the weasel answer, it depends, okay? So when I have uh, a primarily military audience or military participants playing the game, um, I tend to get very similar outcomes, um, you know, within, you know, plus or minus a standard deviation. Uh, when I have civilians play, military positions, uh, I get a very different types of outcomes. Because again, they tend to, they, they're, the military have all been kind of beaten up to think the same way as they look at the problem. They kind of work through some sort of military calculus in their head. Uh, whereas my, the civilians who find themselves in that role uh, may approach it very differently. When they look at that little card that says, orchestrate a military victory, um, what does that mean to them? And it may not, they're not sitting there marching through in their heads about, okay, that means I need to land at Port Stanley and I need to get across the island and I need to be able to take uh, Goose Bay Green. Now, they may be thinking it means something totally different in terms of, if I can just embargo it, all right, and I just put a blockade around it and I get the United States to announce that they're gonna, they're gonna participate as well, that's a military win in my mind. I go, ooh, well, that's hmm, interesting. But that's because of who came and played. So it's usually not the game itself, as long as you've built in enough ambiguity and room for people to interpret some of these objectives, then it's what they bring to the party that drives some of the differences in outcomes. That's why I say who comes matters uh, because you're really counting on their personal experience and their ability to think on their feet and to interact. Like you don't bring a bunch of introverts to a matrix game. Oh my God, <laughs> all right, it's really painful. Okay, now, which leads me to your first part. Yeah, people who can't get into the role play, this is a tough one. Um, it's one of the reasons I like more than one person to play a role, all right? So I don't have a single point of failure because the odds I have two people who can't play Margaret Thatcher um, is obviously less than I have one person who doesn't know how to play Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and usually it takes just a little bit of coaching uh, to help them kind of get into their role. And what I've seen is uh, the round one is terrible. Okay, <laughs> because everyone's trying to feel this out and, and figure it out. And if they haven't played a Matrix game before, they just don't know how to do it. So I watched the game that, that Tom ran once at a, a gaming convention. And the game was about the German, the German general staff trying to decide what to do with their new Type 9 Charlie ocean-going uh, submarines. So it's late in the war. 
The type nine has been introduced. They have a handful of them. Should they go and terrorize the East Coast of the United States with it? Should they use it in a more pressurized campaign against the UK? What should they do? And you had all sorts of people who had different uh, perspectives on it. They were people who had a political perspective because they were representing uh, a, a party government line. You had people, submariners, you had um, the folks representing the actual submarine combat side of the house. You had people who were representing the army and whether the army even care. And this stupid submarine was just a draw on resources that they didn't see was actually gonna ever produce anything. So they were just happy to see the whole submarine program die. They all had those different types of objectives. But the first round, when Tom turned to the woman who was playing the senior, the senior admiral for this quote unquote German working group and said, ma'am, the meeting is yours. There was this painful silence. And that's when Tom stepped in and said, so perhaps what you could do is first go around and have everyone give their initial thoughts, okay? And because again, people didn't really know how to get into it. Uh, and so that helped where, where the people started looking down at their little note cards, they were given their index cards about what they were supposed to be pushing and, and what counted as a win for the finance ministry and what counted as a win for the army. Uh, to kind of start to slowly get them into it. But uh, Tom would very gently, very gently suggest a few things, but he was very loath to say, so how about if in this turn you were to do X? Now he's just taken over and play, is playing for the play, okay? I mean, again, as you look in there, and, that, and that, that poor thief that just doesn't want to enter the room, and you know that he needs to come forward because there's a trap in the room, and for all this to work, the thief is gonna to have to be the one to discover the trap. And you're just as DM, you're biting your tongue going, come on, dude, just go in. I spent three days designing this room, get in there. <laughs> okay, so there is that tension of how much as a facilitator do you push reluctant players? And again, and part of my safety net has been to have more than one person in the role. And for anything I think I'm gonna need, I don't have enough people, uh, I got unitary roles, then I try to make sure that if I know the people who are coming to play or have had experience game with them before, or at least I have word of mouth that, uh, yeah, the, you know, the general kind of gets this sort of thing. He's pretty good at this. He, he gets the what if scenarios. Okay, then I'll go out on a limb and assign him a solitary role and I won't have a twofer trying to cover down on one character. Uh, that's about the best. Tom's got some better, uh, better, Tom's got more advice for how to kind of help nudge people along. Um, but even Tom's been frustrated in scenarios where he's, he's just had senior officers who just basically quit. They won't play because they don't get it, which is, again, phenomenally frustrating. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? We're down to the hardcore. Hey, Pete. Um, my name is Mark Hoover. Thank you for your time. I guess I just had a question in your experience. Um, I guess what levels of leadership or team members do you find these types of exercises kind of yield the most interesting insights? You know, are they generally more interesting for seniors or, or mid-ranked officers or, or in our case, um, uh, yeah, foreign affairs officers? I'm just kind of curious mm -hmm. what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, so it runs the gambit. I mean, again, it, it, it's not one of the satisfying answers I can tell you, oh yeah, seniors play these games much better. Um, the Israelis use very senior people. Uh, if not the prime minister himself, uh, then a deputy. Um, most of the times when they have a foreign country, like they need, uh, like uh, you can imagine that they need uh, someone to play the Egyptian president. It'll be the former Israeli ambassador to Egypt who will play that Egyptian president role. Uh, so they use some pretty senior folks uh, in their stuff. Um, ones that I've been more familiar with, it tends to be more mid-grade. And, and in part, this is because of, again, being at the war college and, and the kind of circles, the, the, the rank of the officers that get involved. Um, I tend to see this being played by either uh, civil servants or military officers who are kind of in that 04 to 06 kind of range, maybe a one star, depends on the, if it's a policy issue we're trying to nug our way through. Um, but otherwise, it tends to be that mid-grade crowd. I've sat down with juniors um, in more of an educational environment kind of thing, just to help to acquaint them with the sorts of arguments they might encounter when dealing in a certain situation. Um, but a lot of this gets mapped back to, go back to my first lecture on game design. It's, well, what is it you're trying to get out of this? Because if you're trying to get insight into the senior levels of government and how they might address a problem, and you don't want to bring in a bunch of junior folks who have, you know, they're, they're, they're fresh into the service and they have no idea what the higher positions uh, have to contend with. Um, 
people say, oh, but that's, that gets out of the box thinking. Okay, yes, there are pros and cons to that. Um, but sometimes it gets very difficult then when you try to sell those results upstream to explain how the United States should perhaps pursue a certain policy. And they say, so how did you arrive at this policy? And you go, well, a bunch of first years out of Georgetown suggested it. You're going to be met with silence. <laughs> Right. So uh, it, it does track back to what's the objective? What is it we're trying to understand? I mean, that, that uh, the policy game around British acquisition of the Joint Strike Fighter was played by uh, one and two stars in the Royal Air Force and in the acquisition force, uh, the acquisition side of the house for the uh, uh, UK Ministry of Defense, because they were the sorts of people who were wrestling with this problem. So they were the ones who actually asked for the game from Tom. So in that case, they had a keen interest in trying to understand it. Um, the problem it comes when you've got, you've got a problem over here uh, in, in your world, and you're trying to find people to come in and play out that problem for your understanding, as opposed to problems they have that you're bringing the technique to. When you've got that latter case, usually you get people who are much more energetic and engaged because it's their problem and they're looking for an answer, and they're more likely to engage with it, in which case you usually have an easier time matching problem to participant at the right level. It's when you're kind of sitting back going, wouldn't it be interesting if, and you're generating your own research question, that then it gets to be a little more of a challenge to go out there to beat the bush to find people who are willing to participate and get them at the right level. So. Thank you. Pete, I was wondering if you could just mention briefly about how you record and write up the results from the games. Yeah. So remember that those sheets I had on that notebook or on that clipboard, those are, those are crucial. And it also helps to have one to two dedicated note takers, ethnographers who are just taking notes in the background. All right. And because one of the things that I would miss is like when, uh, in that Falklands example, when the, the UN would go and sponsor talks, okay. Uh, between Argentina and the UK and they'd wander or Argentina and the United States and they'd wander off in a corner for three minutes. All right. While I dealt with the other players, I, I missed that conversation. I don't know what they talked about because right? I'm not there. An ethno would trail that group and take notes uh, to their discussions. Um, but then so usually you end up with a two part report um, in terms of one, the first part of the report tends to just kind of be a, um, a step, a move one, move two, move three, kind of the narrative that that played out. OK, and kind of the flow over time of how the whoever the, the British did and the UN said and the United States backed away. Uh, but later after the defeat of this, they came in and Chile won the day. Okay. You kind of have that, just that, that reportage of what happened. And usually that leans heavily on my note sheets because there's a pretty quick, succinct little bullets to kind of recapture the flow. But then there's the, the, the power of the matrix game then is the post game discussion. And typically you do it in two ways. You do the in roll and out of roll. So the in-roll discussion is people keep playing the general, the UN, the president, and you're asking them about why they did things that they did in the game. And other players are saying, look, I thought we had an agreement on move four. Why did you back down from that then by turn six? I don't get it because that totally screwed me. All right, discuss, discuss. You capture all that in, in, in notes. And then you do the, okay, but coming out of role, and these are one for games where you have a very specific kind of sponsor perspective on, I'm trying to get advice to help me understand a problem. And we've done this matrix game. And at the heart of it, you've got that core question. Why did you do the game in the first place? There was something you were trying to get illuminated. Now you turn directly to that question, to that hypothesis, to those research questions. And you ask the participants in their professional capacity and as informed by the game, what do they think about this core question? So you get both the in-roll understanding for why people behaved the way they did in the course of the game, but then in the end, you're really trying to get a group of subject matter experts to illuminate a central hypothesis that you have. And now we do their second round where we talk strictly to that. Now, if you're trying to get all this done in one day, you can see where this, you gotta keep this pretty tight. So maybe you allocate the morning for four hours of play, you go to lunch, right after lunch, you do a, a quick and dirty hour of of game of game uh plenary type stuff in terms of of why did you do what president tell us what your objectives were okay blah 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 and then you, you use reserve the rest of the time 
uh, hour to no more than two, because people will be beat at this point. Um, what, do, what did you learn? What were your key takeaways? What do you want us to take away uh, in terms of the game, the game sponsors, the State Department, the conflict group, in terms of the message you want to go up the chain based on this game? And it's like, you can't surge trust. There's no way, given the next 10 years and our current budget constraints, that we're going to be able to do anything remotely like we tried to play in the game. So we need to start taking steps now to bulk, you know, you know and that's what you capture. And that way your report then reflects both the, the context that these insights came out of and how they're then applicable to the hypothesis or problem at hand. Anything else? I have my game recommendation. Remember last time we talked about the games. I got my game. I have a new game recommendation when you're ready for that part. Oh, look, it's almost 4.30. So here, here's what I'll close on. So my, my latest game I'm pushing, right? And it's not like I get money back, <laughs> right? Or, or that I get paid to promote these games. But um, from Stronghold Games, Flame Rouge, okay? The Red Flag. Uh, it's a, it's a, a bicycling game. Uh, it is great if you're still, you know, you're still, you're still stuck in your, your COVID-19 world and you're looking for uh, a great family game, right? Highly recommend this. Uh, it's easy to learn. The, the strategies are subtle, um, but the rules are simple. And it's, you, you're, you're, uh, you got two little bicyclists, right? You're a sprinter and you're a rodier, and you're trying to, to uh, win a stage of the Tour de France. Um, some people actually play it and chain the games together like you're doing the entire tour. Um, game plays in under an hour. So that's my current game push. Anything else? Robert, looks like we're a wrap. Well, thank you very much, Pete. And uh, again, this has been recorded, so we'll send out the link uh, for those who want to watch it again. Uh, and or who have colleagues who who can't uh, who couldn't make it today. Okay, so again, thanks everybody, and uh, have happy Fourth of July. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>